Good morning, everyone. My guest today is Dr. Stephen Austin, who is a professor from the University of Alabama and a senior scientific director of the American Foundation for Aging Research. His main research interests are long-lived animals and animal models suitable for aging research. According to his new book, Matthew Sella Zoo, many long-lived species have managed to avoid environmental hazards and the damage of aging. What experiences can our human being draw from them? Well, is there any upper limit for life expectancy? Professor Austin will lead us to the answer. Welcome. Well, Dr. Austin, you have very colorful occupational background from the an English literature grad to a taxi driver, a reporter, then a wild animal trainer, and so on. Finally, you devote yourself into an anti-aging researches. Um, I'm curious about how these seemingly unrelated experiences help with your research now. And in order to train them for movies, you have to spend hours and hours and hours watching them, trying to get them to do specific things. And that experience really got me interested in how animals experience the world. And that in turn in awakened my interest in science. I thought, this is nice practical experience, but what could I learn if I tried to study the animal mind, animal consciousness, animal behavior more formally and scientifically? And uh, that decision was helped a lot by the fact that I got seriously injured once and I had some time in the hospital to think about my future. <laughs> and I thought my future would be a lot longer uh, if I did something uh, scientifically than if I continued to train dangerous animals for the movies. Uh, you have mentioned about that training lines at Wake your interest in biology. Is that true? Yes, that is true. Um, I mean, I think I'd, I'd always had pets, and I remember my high school biology teacher telling me that I was going to be a biologist, and I thought that was the most oh. ridiculous idea that I'd ever heard, because at that time, I knew very well that I was going to be a mathematician, and yet here I am going to college. I changed from math to English, got an English degree because I wanted to write a great novel, oh, wow. and 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 many of my job experiences were gathered while I was working on my novel, trying to gain experiences that would be interesting to write about. Um, since you've never heard of my novel and neither has <laughs> anyone else, uh, you, you can tell how that, heard, that worked out. Um, so I basically, then I just stumbled into this job training uh, lions for the movie business and it was an accident. I didn't think I'd do it for more than a few weeks because I was only supposed to work on one movie. And then weeks turned into months and months turned into years. And the next thing you knew, I was absolutely fascinated by animals and I decided to go to graduate school to study animal behavior. Well, it's um, both exciting and dangerous. Okay. Yeah, and, and in fact, in, in graduate school, I never thought about aging. Um, I was interested in an animal social behavior. And it was only when I spent months and months in the field in South America following various animals that I discovered that one of the animals that I've been looking at aged really quickly. Uh, these are um, opossums and they're about the size of a cat, a house cat. And they only live about 18 months on average and maybe two years, two and a half years at the most. So they don't live any longer than a mouse in the laboratory. And that observation just fascinated me. I wondered why, what, what is there special about them that would make them live such a short time for a creature that's, that, that I would expect would live 10 or 15 years at least. And that kind of interest uh, really was what started my interest in aging. And I probably was working in the field for at least a decade just on this biological puzzle, I didn't even think about human aging. I was only thinking about, there's this really interesting puzzle, which is that nature is so good at taking a single fertilized egg and developing it into a healthy young adult person or mouse or chicken or whatever. 
And it would seem that it should be much easier to just maintain what you've produced than it would be to produce it out of a single cell. But yet aging, I look around, aging was almost ubiquitous. So, so that was a puzzle that really motivated me. And then in about 10 years, I'm kind of slow. So in about 10 years, I thought, wait a second, people would be really interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> and so I then, I, I then got more focus on human aging and what we, what we might learn from animals that might allow us to uh, prolong human health and life. Then and to now, have you found the answer to your puzzle? I mean, why organisms age at different speeds and um, the secrets behind these phenomena? Um, what can we draw experiences from that? Yeah, so so uh, I the answer is complicated. The answer is I'm satisfied that I understand the basic outline of why some animals age quickly and some of it age slowly. It's not a simple story. It has to do with the environment they live in, with their metabolism, with the external dangers that they have to live with. But I think we have a broad outline. We understand why various species live different amounts of time. And that knowledge, I think, helps us look at these species and think about which ones could we really learn something that's relevant to humans about slowing aging. Just because an animal's long live, I don't think that's enough. I think it has to be a particular kind of long life. Um, and by that, I mean animals face this, these internal hazards, this internal damage that's going on all the time. You know, the fundamental processes of life are damaging. Um, yeah. And our bodies are very, very good at repairing that damage, but ultimately it fails. And what I think we should be focusing on is species that are better at repairing that damage than we are. We do something very different in bo most biomedical research this, these days, which is we take animals that are very, very unsuccessful at combating yeah. <laughs> damage, and we think if we can make them a little bit less unsuccessful, maybe that will teach us, and we're already massively more successful than they are how to how to fight aging better ourselves and to me that's just the wrong approach it just doesn't <laughs> you know the motive my motivating uh, mantra is that nature is smarter than we are and we would do well to look to nature because it's had billions of years and billions of species to experiment with and it's no doubt come up with some solutions that we would never think of when we are speaking of the unsuccessful experimental um, animals, I suppose that you refer to mice. Mice and worms and flies, they're all short lives for their kind of organism. So worms are short lives for nematodes, flies are short lives for insects, and mice are among the shortest lives of all the mammals. And, and then have we found out that if there are any animals that are more suitable than these kind of model organisms for us to do the experiments. I think there are, and I think there are a lot of them. And I think we're finding more and more and more of them all the time. And I think that's the direction we would be well to go. And to take one example, um, a naked mole rat is the same size as a mouse, but lives more than 10 times as long. 70% you know, of our laboratory mice die of cancer. Naked mole rats very, very rarely get cancer. So they've got some success at combating cancer and some success at combating aging. That's at least as good as the way we do it and probably somewhat better. So that's the kind of animals. There are all kinds of birds that are better at repairing damage than we are. Um, some kind of animals are good for one specific thing. So for instance, I think very large animals are very useful for figuring out how to resist cancer. Because if you think about it, a, every cell in your body pretty much has the capacity to become a cancer cell. And only one has to achieve that capacity to kill you. Well, large animals have many, many, many more cells 
animals at risk than small animals, yet they somehow manage. And in your a new book, um, Matthew Therese Zoo, you have said that uh, birds are live longer than beasts. I mean, the terrestrial uh, animals than marine animals are among all, all the animals they are living the longest. Is that true? For their body size and their metabolism, the thing that interests me about birds is that everything about their physiology that we think we understand would suggest they should age very quickly. They have a very high metabolic rate, much higher than a similar sized mammal. They have a high body temperature. It would be a serious fever if we had that body temperature. They have levels of glucose in their blood that would be a diabetic in a human. And despite all of those things, they live on average about three times longer in the wild than an average mammal lives in the comfort of a zoo or a laboratory. And, uh, and they, they somehow um, face the challenges of life in the wild, the droughts and the heat waves and the storms and a, um, famine potentially. And yet they live after year after year. I like to make a comparison between mice, the laboratory mice that we use in the, in, in the field, they live three to four months. In the wild, they live three to four months on the average in about a year at the most. A house sparrow, which I believe you have in China as well, it's the most common bird in the world. It's yeah. the same size as a mouse. It lives up to 20 years in the wild. 20 so years. That's an, 20 years. So it's an enormous difference. Um, so I think there's something really, really interesting that we could learn from the birds, even the common birds. Like you don't have to, you know, it's not like studying whales where you'd have to invent all kinds of special processes. We're very, very good at taking care of birds. We've been doing it for centuries. We had pet birds for centuries. House sparrows make very good pets. They do well in the laboratory. Uh, if it were up to me, if someone handed me $100 million tomorrow, I would assemble a team and said, let's figure out how this house sparrow lives 20 years in the wild. And there's something in that that will help us enhance people's health. Yeah. Um, as we know that the average life expectancy in is higher in women than in men. So what might have causes these gender differences in lifespan? So is there, is it the same in the animal world? Yes, that's a very interesting question. This is one of the features of human biology that's relatively unique, which is that women live longer than men under virtually every circumstance we can imagine. When times are good, and everybody's living a long time, women live longer. When times are bad and there's sickness and famine, women live longer. They live longer when they're babies. They, they survive better when they're babies. They survive better when they're 90 year olds. And we have no idea why. Now, in the animal world, it's not uncommon for males to live longer. It depends on the species and it depends on the circumstances. For instance, one of the animals, that group of animals I think is really interesting are bats. And in the longest live bats that we know, all the long lived individuals are males. And mm -hmm. we don't know why that is. We don't know if it's environmental or if it's genetic or if it's some combination of those things. Um, because uh, one of the things about studying animals in the wild is you're not just studying you're studying how their physiology plays out on the on what they have to do to survive in the wild. One of the things that female bats do is they have the largest babies of any mammal relative to their body size. They have to provide for them when they're pregnant and when they're uh, after they're born, they have to provide for them. And that's a very draining amount of energy, whereas males just go out and eat and come back. And so it might be something that simple in the bats, but there's enough variability in the animal kingdom where males live longer in some species and females live longer that I think we could probably learn quite a bit 
about human aging if we understood that. There's, there's actually a, a twist on the sex differences that's also quite interesting, which is that even though women live longer, very reliably, also very reliably, they're in worse health later in life. They have more aches and pains, they go to the doctor more, they take more medications, and we don't really understand that either. It almost doesn't make sense if you think how robust they are in bad times otherwise. So what I like to say is if we could make men live as long as women, and we could keep women healthy as long as men, yeah. then we would do a great deal for human health. Uh, just just, just by accomplishing that. Yeah, yeah. And well, based on your research on longevity, animal would say that there are animals that could live forever, or um, according to our knowledge until now, what are the most uh, long-lived animals? Well, um, there are a handful of animals that seem to be potentially immortal. And I say potentially because nothing is, you know, that if you yeah. live long enough, you're going to have an accident of some sort. If you're a person, you're going to walk out in front of a bus <laughs> or, or somebody's going to drop something off of the top of a building on your head, something. <laughs> um, and the same is true of animals. But, um, but there are some animals that as far as we know, they don't seem to age. Now, there are some animals that age very slowly. I'll take the case of a tortoise. Tortoises oh, yeah. live a long time. They age very slowly, but they do age. The old ones have, they get cancer, they get um, cataracts, they get heart problems, they get all of the problems. It just takes them a very, very long time. But there are some simple animals, and I'm thinking now of hydra, little tiny freshwater polyps that look like uh, sea anemones. And as far as we can tell, so the way that they reproduce, in the laboratory at least, is that a bud, a new hydra grows out of their side, and eventually it detaches, becomes an independent hydra. And for as long as anybody has had the patience to study them in the laboratory, which is about seven years, they don't show any increase in death rate, they don't show any decrease in reproductive rate, there are various subtle ways that we can assess their health, how efficient they are at catching prey, for instance. That doesn't seem to change. And so there's something that we could seriously learn from them. Now, they're interesting organisms in that they have a thin sort of band of stem cells around their middle. And except for those cells, every other cell in their body is fairly young. Those stem cells reproduce and then they migrate either to the end of, to the base or off to the tentacles, and then they're shed into the environment. So no cell in a hydra, except for the stem cells, is older than about three weeks. Yet they go on and on and on. And so I think where the real lesson is to be gained from them is by understanding how those stem cells survive so well. Now I have to say, that I've just made this claim that they're potentially immortal, but we really don't know that because we, like I say, the longest we followed in individuals is about seven years. And for an animal that small, that reproduces that fast, seven years is a very, very, very long yeah. time. So we're assuming that it would just continue to do that for decade after decade after decade, but we don't know that for sure. So it is possible that at some point those stem cells would start, would get damaged and start to become exhausted. Um, they certainly grew a tremendous number of divisions without doing that. So as far as we know, that's an animal that doesn't age. That's as close as we have to knowing that an animal doesn't age. It's a very, very rare thing in nature. Then can but I- it's talk? very important. Hmm? Yeah, so I mean, it's very important because if an animal ages slowly, it means it's getting old. It's just getting old slowly. It's not aging at all. It means it's staying young forever. Yeah. And that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the, you know, what we would most like. I don't think that's achievable in, in people, but it's certainly a goal that's, that's worthy <laughs> of trying. Then can I control the conclusion that uh, to the animals, 
the slower they grow, the longer they live. Yes, that's a that that is there is a trend. So things like um, like tortoises, you know, it might take them thirty years to become an adult. I study some clams that live in the ocean. It might take them fifty years to become an adult. Greenland shark, which may that's live cool. as long as four hundred years, takes them one hundred and fifty years to even become reproductively mature, and. That is very, very strange. That is that would be a very, very painful adolescence that has, lasts a century or more. But before they become reproductively mature, how yes. likely their life will be? Right, uh, and and the other, but they're very, very, very slow. And I don't think most people realize they think of sharks as being fast. Greenland sharks live in very cold water. They live in water that's very close to freezing. And they move as slow, they actually move more slowly than most 80 year old people walk. So that's very, very slow indeed. Then um, I'm curious about that. Is there any interesting or impressive thing that happened during your field investigation? Oh, many, many, many. <laughs> Many, many, many things. You know, one thing I got from my taxi driving years. So, so one of the things that, that, that people start to lose as they get older, that one of the first things to go is their spatial memory. People kind of get confused. Where, where did I leave my car? That sort of thing. <laughs> one of the things that I got from my taxi driving and my field biology experience, I think, is that I have a really good sense of direction. I can drive through your, your city oh. and come back 10 years later and remember how I got around in the city. That's just, that's something that I, that I attribute to my field experience and also my experience driving taxis where I had to remember how to get people there. In terms of adventures, yes, I mean, I've stepped on crocodiles, uh, you know, I've, uh, I, I've had snakes drop on me uh, oh. out of the ceiling of the house. Um, I've had my share of adventures. I've had rattlesnakes going in front of me and behind me at the Isn't same time. Is that poisonous? Yes, yes. So I've been very lucky. I've, I've never been really seriously injured in the field. Although it, just when I was dealing with wild animals in captivity, I did once, I have to say, I've just been bragging about my sense of direction. But once when I was working in Papua New Guinea, in a very, very remote area, a week's walk from a little jungle airstrip. I got lost one night when I was out radio tracking an animal and I waited too late to start heading back to camp. And I got confused about where I was. And rather than just start running around aimlessly and get hopelessly lost, I just stopped. I got under a tree. I thought, I will wait until morning when it's light again and I can see some landmarks because this is an area that there were no people in. There were just the people that were in my expedition. Uh, there were no people that lived in the area. Um, it turns out, fortunately for me, the people that were in my expedition, the local people were so good in the forest that they managed to track me in the dark and they oh. found me about midnight. They found me under the tree. And that gave me a tremendous amount of respect for people who live, you know, we tend to think of them as, as being primitive because they're not technological, but they, they know things that we don't. They see the forest in ways that we simply cannot do. I am both astonished and a little bit thrilling of oh, her stories is so brave you are. Lucky, I think I'm lucky. <laughs> I am. Well, um, oh, I'm curious about another topic is that we have uh, talked a lot about the calorie restriction. Then when you speaking of this topic, um, you seem to put more faith in fasting rather than calorie restriction. Well, is that true? Or right. why do you think that fasting- Yes, it is. Diet? The difference between Intermittent fasting, so fasting for a certain length of time, let's say every day or every few days, is that people can do it. People cannot do 
calorie restriction the way we do it in my except for there are some exceptional people that can but it's but it's very rare and we're also not sure that calorie restriction the way that we do it in rats and mice would be beneficial for people because it's so hard to translate an animal that gets its food restricted but has no opportunity to move around and it lives in a cage the size of a shoebox um, and gets to be very big, very fat compared to an animal in the wild. We don't know if what we're doing is taking an overfed obese animal, laboratory animal, restricting it until it's at a healthy body weight and that's why it's living longer or whether there's something about an animal with a healthy body weight and making it very, very, very lean and whether that's the effect. Mm -hmm. And there aren't good data in people because like I say, most people can't do that. There are short-term uh, short uh, studies and those studies show some health benefits, but, they, but they're not getting exceptionally lean like the, rice, like the rats and the mice are. And the health benefits that are seen are also very, very small relative to a healthy person. So my thought is calorie restriction, if people could do it, will probably be very beneficial for people that are overweight or obese. Yeah. And I don't think it would be that beneficial for people who are already at a healthy body weight. In fact, it might even be detrimental. You know, one of the things that happens is the people that have done this long term, the people in the calorie restriction society, they have a very they lose a lot of muscle. Oh. And they also lose a lot of weight, but they lose a lot of muscle. And one of the things when people get older is that lacking muscle strength starts to become a problem. You know, they have trouble getting up out of chairs. Combination of sports and calorie restriction. But when we do it together, will we continue to lose our muscle? Well, that's the problem. So when I, so I've been to two international meetings of the calorie restriction society where they asked me to come talk and one of the things is they they don't exercise. They will, will constantly try to encourage one another to get more exercise. But the thing is, exercise makes them hungry, you know, <laughs> as it does, and it may, it makes it more difficult to keep the calorie restriction regime going. And one of the things, one of the nice studies is done by uh, a doctor, Luigi Fontana, is he compared people in the calorie restriction society with people who were lean because they were vegans or because they were very serious exercisers. And the di difference in the, the, the health metrics that he used were very, very small between those three groups. And for some of the things, for, for muscle mass, for instance, the, the exercisers were better. So, uh, so it's very, it would be very difficult to compare, to do exercise and calorie restriction. Now, it wouldn't be so difficult to combine exercise necessarily and intermittent fasting. In fact, I used to do that. Um, I, in college, I was a wrestler and uh, wrestlers are always trying to lose weight because if you can get to a lower weight class, you're a better wrestler. And so I would lose 10 kilos every year when it got to be wrestling season. And that wasn't easy for me to do. And sometimes I would fast for three days, no, no food, no water, nothing. And then no, I would wrestle. No and then water for three in. days? Yeah, this was, this was before I got into biology. So that was really stupid. You know, <laughs> I really, I didn't destroy my kidneys doing that, right? But then, yeah. then I could put on four kilos before my match because I'm so dehydrated and I drink water and I, I keep it. So that's at least possible. It wasn't a very pleasant existence, I have to say, but at least it, it, it's possible if you're motivated enough. Um, so I, I really do think that the intermittent fasting seems to have benefits. People seem to be able to do it. Um, and so I think there may, might be something major about maintaining health with the intermittent fasting. Certainly we'll know because there are enough people doing it now, you know, unofficially not as part of official studies. Um, just like there are a lot of people taking metformin now, not an official trial, but at some point in the future, we might say, 
boy, all those 80 year olds that have been t doing intermittent fasting for the last 40 years, they sure look good. Or all the people that have been on metformin for the last 40 years, they sure seem to be healthy uh, for their age. Um, I think we're more likely to learn something fundamental about human aging from these informal experiments, even though they're uncontrolled, but they're uncontrolled, but they can be long term. Whereas nobody is going to fund a controlled study of human diet that lasts 50 years. You know, where you're randomly assigning one group to eat this, another group to eat that. Besides, it's humans. Just because you assign them to a task doesn't mean they're going to do it. You know, unlike mice, if I want my mice to eat a certain hours in a day, it, they have no choice to do it. If I tell my children you can only eat between noon and set six o'clock, they might tell me that they're going to do it, but they're likely not going to. So humans are very bad experimental animals. <laughs> And you just mentioned about metformin. Right? Uh, yes. Some of our followers are curious about that. Some people hold that um, if an anti-aging treatment doesn't work on mice or other uh, model animals, let alone there will be effective in human, or for instance, after metformin's failure in the ITP, um, its life expanding effects seem to have been completed completely navigate oh sorry. yeah i think yeah that's a, it's it's a very interesting thing because i'm wondering how many effective anti-aging treatments we're missing because they don't work in mice and we say ah they're not worth investigating in people but you're absolutely right the um the results with mice are much less promising than what we know about people. Now we haven't done, you know, the blind, double blind controlled experiment like we'd like to uh, in people, but at least from the epidemiology, there's a lot of promise in metformin. And the other thing that's nice about metformin is that it's inexpensive. So it's not something that only rich people can afford. And it also because millions of people have taken it for decades we know it doesn't have horrific side effects that we're going to discover 10 years from now. now some drugs we might discuss, might look fine for the first two years and in 10 years find out all the people are getting stomach cancer that have been taken. I mean, who knows? That's possible. But with metformin, enough people have taken it for long enough that we know exactly what the side effects are. And for most people, they're very mild and, and, and they go away after a while. Then how do you evaluate the experiment team? Do you think that it will have an optimistic future? I mean, the team. Yeah, I mean, I I think we, I think we have a way to approach this, but I'm not a hundred percent happy with what it is. So the way that we have tried to sell the Matt Foreman project is that you start it with older people who are in not very good health. The idea being over a fairly short term study, enough of the unhealthy people who are not on metformin will die and the people who are, or get more diseases and become clearly less healthy. Whereas the people on metformin will not die or develop as many diseases. Now, the nice thing about that study is it's a short term study. You'll get a result, but what it won't tell you is what metformin will do for people who are already healthy, you know, and, and, and that's what most of us want to start doing these things when we're still healthy, right? We don't want to start these things, uh, you know, when we're, when we're ready for the old folks home. And what do you think um, about the upper limit of our life expectancy? Speaking um, of, we need to talk I, about- Yeah, your... I think, I think around a hundred years. I think that's about as well as we can do. Um, and that's about 20% longer than now, right? And the reason yeah. I say that is that's something that we've been able to achieve uh, many ways in the laboratory. And even though I think most of the things we're, disco we're discovering with laboratory animals will not be relevant to people, I think some of them will be. And so the fact that we've sort of regularly been able to extend laboratory animal life by 20% it 
suggests to me that that's a reasonable expectation for us. And then so, if, but if life expectancy was a hundred years, let's say, there would be a number of people that lived into their 130s, let's say, 140s, maybe as long as 150. Um, you know, right now, the oldest person that ever lived lived to be 122 yeah. and a half years and life expectancy is around 80. So that's about 50% more. So if life expectancy were 100, then you'd think, well, maybe the oldest old would live to be 140 or 150. I think that's pretty much the limit unless we dramatically change our biology. And I, I don't expect that we will want to do that. I think we'll want to keep being human in some significant sense. But speaking you know, of- these... Downloading our brain onto a computer is a kind of <laughs> immortality that I don't think that many people would be interested in. Well, speaking of this um, ambitious upper limit of our life expectancy, we need to talk about your famous bet against against Dr. J. Oshin. Yes, so we've had a good time with this bet. You know, and this bet arose, and the 150 was exactly the right. I, I don't think we appreciated at time at the time exactly what a good number that was, and, and, and I'll tell you why. I don't think that we're that anybody's going to reach 150 or get close to 150 as we just get better at treat diagnosing and conventional treatment of individual diseases. You know, I think we'll get a little better and we might gain a few more years at the upper limit. But I think for somebody to live 150 years or for life expectancy to be 100, we're going to have to find some way to treat aging as if it were a disease. We're going to have to have some intervention that really works, some non-standard medical thing, um, a medication, discover something new about sleep or who knows what it will be. Um, so that's why 150, I think, was a good number, because unless we can intervene in the aging process, I don't think we'll reach it. But if we can, then I don't think it's an impossible amount of life extension to get. It's 20%. You know, the difference between 122 and 150 is about 20%. And like I said, we've been able to do that many, many ways in laboratory animals, and I, I think that's We'll probably eventually figure out how to do just as good in people. Well, 20 years have passed since that you first have the bet with him. Um, is there anything happen that will affect the results of this bet? Uh, know, yes. So research? I think that um, what Jay would say is, well, 20 years ago, the oldest person that ever lived was 120, lived 122 years. And now, 20 years later, the oldest person ever lived was 122 years. There has been absolute, and, and nobody's approached it since then. So he's feeling very good uh, about that. <laughs> I'm feeling very good because a number of the interventions that we're discovering increase longevity in mice do a very good job even when they're started relatively late in life. And I don't think anybody expected that. Um, you know, with caloric restriction, the earlier you start it, the bigger the effect is. But there's not much of a difference in the longevity effect of rapamycin if you started young or you started middle age, even if you started old. And I don't know if you know about it, but my book, Methuselah Zoo, is being translated into Chinese. I don't know if you knew that or not, but it should be available in Chinese before too long. Well, it, have it the, the Chinese version published now, or it's just it's not it's, it's just being translated right now. So my guess is it might be a year before it comes out in Chinese. But the fact is, it's coming out. Yeah, we will be looking forward to the Chinese version of your book to be published. Yeah, and and when you get it, you'll have oh, to tell me if it's, buy one. Yeah, and you'll have to tell me if it's a good translation or not. It sounds like you've seen the English version. You'll have to tell me if it's a good trans. Well, no, only tell me if it's a good translation. If it's a bad translation, don't tell me. <laughs> yeah, uh, then I will uh, 
when the the publishment of your book of the Chinese ver both the Chinese version and the English version uh, will, will will come out, I will uh, buy two of them to our edits edits laboratory and Good. and read it. Um, maybe there will be other collaboration or the cooperation between you and uh, the publishment of your book and us. That, that would be nice. That would be nice, yes. I hope that if we have opportunities or if you trust us, we can assist the publishment of your book. That would be great. That would be great. This will be our honor to do that. Oh, let's continue. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Let's continue the uh, interview. Well, in your opinion, what is the most promising anti-aging invention? I mean, drugs, rapamycin, metformin, or any uh, biological reprogramming, or some other intervention? What are the most prom promising I, ones? I actually, the, the one that I have the most hope for is the blood transfusion, and also, combining these things with the right lifestyles, with the right dietary and exercise regime. Because that's something that we really, it's hard for us to do in laboratory animals, right? We can, we can feed them drugs and see what happens, but it's hard for them, us to feed them drugs and give them exercise and all the, all the things that, that, that humans could do. The reason that I think the blood transfusion is so promising is first of all, it makes sense biologically. I mean, the latest work in that suggests that it's not some magic substance in young blood that rejuvenates, but it's getting rid of some bad stuff in old blood that's the problem, which means that replacing blood every so it's something that's easy enough for us to do. And because blood goes through, circulates through all the organs, and it picks up lots of damaged products from the organs, it makes sense that that sort of diluting out that damage periodically would, would, be, would be helpful. Um, the reason I like that is that there's not obvious side effects. You know, we don't know yet what the, whether there'll be long-term side effects of rapamycin. I mean, if, if just looking at the mouse data, uh, rapamycin is by far the most promising candidate by far, not, nothing even close. Uh, because not only does it so regularly make mice live longer, but it improves health in so many ways. Um, but the young blood, I really, I really like because th there's very little chance of there being sort of surprise side effects from it. And it makes sense that having less older blood in your body could be good for lots and lots of organs. So if I had to pick one thing that I think is the most promising right now, um, it would be that. Reprogramming, I think, is early. Uh, we'll see. Maybe that will turn out to be something. Um, are we going to find drugs that are better than rapamycin? And the, would rapamycin, is it going to have side effects that we don't know yet? But these are a lot of questions. The thing that I love is that there's so much excitement in the field coming from so many directions, you know, drugs, reprogramming, dietary things, blood. Um, some of these things are going to turn out to work. And when that happens, you know, it's, 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 it's going to change everything about human life. It's going to, you know, our futures are going to look different to us. If we can have another 10 or 20 years of health, I think people will think about their careers differently. They'll think about having children differently. I think they'll think about pretty much everything differently. You know, we invented, at least in Europe, in the US, we invented retirement just a hundred years ago. Before that, you know, people worked till they dropped basically. Um, so that was a whole new phase of human life. And now we kind of take it for granted. So we might have another, we might invent something else, some other phase of life. Maybe what we think of as mid-career now, people say, I'm tired of doing that. I want to go back to school and study English literature and write novels for the second, 
you know, 60 years of my life. Well, um, in your opinion, uh, or how in your personal experiences, how do you fight aging? Or could you give us some advice on living a healthier and longer life? Doing exercise? I do. I do. I'm, I'm a pretty fanatical exerciser. Uh, that's I don't take any um, medications. I don't take any vitamins or supplements or anything like that. Uh, but I but I do exercise. I try to maintain a healthy body weight, and I do both strength exercise and endurance exercise. It's the one thing I'm pretty religious about about doing. Um, and then I try to do everything else sensibly. I'm waiting for data before I decide I'm going to try. You know, I've been tempted. I've been tempted to try metformin. Uh, but on the other hand, I would kind of like to see the evidence <laughs> before <laughs> before I do that. And we also set a quota for our followers to ask what they want to you. Or so if you uh, would like to answer their questions, I will uh, ask our followers to offer me sure. some of the questions. Sure. Oh, well, the first sure. one is, uh, do you think that um, to extend our lives means that we need to treat the diseases related to aging? Well, I think one of the things that the geroscience movement is doing is it's trying to create the best preventative medicine in the world. That is, it's trying to prevent people from getting diseases rather than treating diseases. And certainly we're going to get better and better and better at finding ways to treat diseases. Um, but I think that when we find something that keeps people healthy longer, it will also delay diseases as a group. We won't have to, you know, get our, our, our you know, our coronary bypass and then two years later get cancer and then the year after that get Alzheimer's disease. The idea is that we will push all these diseases back by decades. So I think it will change medical practice. It will be more preventative than curative. And live longer or live healthier? What are the most important ones? Oh, living healthier, uh, for sure. Um, you know, the hardest thing, I mean, one of the things we don't know, let's imagine we're successful and we've found something that, that makes us live 20 years longer. Um, if we get an extra 20 years of health, I think everybody would agree that's wonderful. If we get an extra 10 years of health, but an extra 10 years of debility at the end of life, then my thought is a lot, that would be attractive to a lot fewer people. You know, they already see people going through some miserable times late in life and they think, well, doubling, doubling that length of time, that's not really something that I'm interested in. One of the things that always surprises me when I give public talks uh, on, on anti-aging advances, I, I start asking people, how many people in here, if I had this pill, and if you took it right now, you'd start aging 50% slower than you are now. How many people would take that pill? And usually about 75% raise their hand. And that's a pretty low number. Yeah, that's a pretty low number to me because these are people who chose to come to a talk on this topic, right? So these are probably not a, a random audience. Um, and so people are, are more ambivalent about living longer than they should be because I think they associate it with, they see a 90 year old and they say, oh, can I see another 10 or 12 years or 20 years of, of gradually getting worse than the average 90 year old? And they say, no, they don't realize that we're talking about is you know 60 being the new 90 or something like that. If they thought about it that way, I think a lot more people would be on board with it. Well, the second question from our followers is that, do you think our life expectancy will be restricted by the AFLIC limit? Uh, no, no, I don't. Um, I don't because uh, for, for one thing, uh, we're finding all kinds of ways to get rid of these senescent cells. 
at least in mice. Some of those, again, some of those ways are probably going to translate to people. So I don't think that that's ultimately going to be what limits our, our life. What I think is going to limit our life is our ability to repair DNA damage. Um, but when our we're... telomeres become shorter and shorter, how can we fix on that? Well, what you can do is you can kill that cell and replace it with another cell that has a small, has longer telomere. Um, and then for the cells that are the most prone, I mean, the cells that are most prone are things like brain cells, neurons, and heart cells, cardiomyocytes. And those cells, because they don't divide during life, they don't get short telomeres. So it's not really a problem for our cells that are at the most risk. You know, our brain cells, our heart cells, our muscle cells, those are the cells that sustain the most damage uh, because they're old cells. You know, they're not continuously replaced. Thank you. Well, maybe in time flies, we will come to the last question. Um, it is related to the situation or the phenomenon in China. Well, in recent years, healthy aging became, becomes a national strategy in China since that uh, the China, Chinese social aging has become even uh, severe with the development of the society. While Chinese aging research has developed rapidly according to these aspects, but most of our Chinese scientists have limited access to these discoveries. What do you think of uh, China can do to go global? I think that what happens is that Chinese researchers need to come to a lot of international conferences and exchange ideas with gero scientists from the West, because it's, it's, these conferences are not, the best thing about scientific conferences is not listening to people give talks, because as we all know today, you can do that by Zoom. You don't need to get together. The most interesting things happen at the coffee, at people talking informally, talking about experiments. You've been having problems with this. Well, we solved this. That's the way that you get respect. And that's the way that real science operates. It really works fast if you have a free interchange of ideas. And I think that probably Chinese scientists don't come enough to international conferences in yes. the rest of the world. And we also don't go to uh, enough conferences in, in China. I, I, that's absolutely certain. I mean, there's something of a language barrier where these days, so many people in China speak better English than I do that I think that that's no, no longer a problem, right? When I first went to, to China, I first went to China, I think in about 1991. 1991, um, you have come to China? Yeah, yeah, I was in oh, Beijing. Really yeah, and it, uh, you know, it was very rare to hear someone that spoke English. It was basically just people in the hotels and in the tourist industry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but now, uh, you know, it's, it's, that's changed enormously. And, uh, you know, there's no hope that Americans will learn Chinese because we're just horrible at languages. But now that the Chinese speak such good English, there's, there's really very few barriers for more and more scientific interchange. And I think that would be beneficial to us and, then of it, and, and beneficial to you. Oh, I, I agree on that. I think we also need to awaken our uh, awaken our awareness on the anti aging research or um, to the industry of longevity. Yeah, I, I know very little about what's going on in that <laughs> in China. You know, very That's little, crazy. and I'm sure there's very good stuff going on there, but I just don't hear about it. So. Yeah, we also uh, still continue to develop ourselves since that we are at the starting point for a very initial stage for Chinese anti-aging research. So I also right. agree on you that uh, in the future, our Chinese scientists need to go global to, uh, uh, I mean, concentrate on participate in the international conferences and show our domestic research as well as make cultural communication with the uh, 
foreign scientists to develop that would our be great. Oil logo. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Can't wait for that to happen. <laughs> so, although uh, not willing, our interview needs to come to an end. It's just really appreciated that you could accept our interview and um, output so many fruitful perspective and fabulous interpretation. Uh, it will leave me endless after tastes. I mean, well, um, now let's come to an end. It's your true love. Right. Very good. Bye. And thank you. It was, it was fun talking with you.